The title of our message today is Why the Pilgrims Really Came to America. I think you probably, would, like myself, remember a vision that came on our televisions not too long ago, seeing Islamic extremists on a beach cutting the heads off of Christians. It is called today terrorism, where through fear, those in power are trying to change the behavior of others. And this is not new because it took place in the days of the Reformation. Those in power felt that uniformity of religion must exist in a given society. And this conviction rested on the belief that there was, not, there, there was one true religion and that it was the duty of the civic authorities to impose it forcibly, if necessary, in the interest of saving the souls of all their citizens. With this thought in mind, terrible atrocities were done to people, unspeakable things that you would not think that one human being would do to another, much less people that called themselves Christians. Even though these atrocities were happening in Europe, we want to talk to you today about one group of pilgrims that landed at Plymouth Rock, and they were called Puritans. The belief that the pilgrims came to America in search of religious freedom is inspiring, but in the sense that we usually mean it, it is not really true. This reality is promoted in a book entitled The First Thanksgiving, what the real story tells us about loving God and learning from history, and it was written by Robert Tracy McKenzie. When on numerous occasions he had shared this reality, he was almost always gets pushback from the audience. And that's understandable since most of us from our childhood have been raised to believe quite the opposite. But if we're really going to learn from the pilgrim story, we need to be willing to listen to their words and not put our words into their mouths. The popular understanding of the pilgrims that came to America in search of religious freedom, even though it's technically true, but it also is misleading. It is technically true in the freedom to worship according to the dictates of scripture was at the very top of their list of priorities. They had already risked everything to escape religious persecution and the majority never would have knowingly chose a destination where they would once again wear the yoke of anti-Christian bondage as they described their experience in England. To say that the pilgrims came in search of religious freedom is misleading, however, in that it implies that they lacked that such liberty in Holland. Remember that the pilgrims did not come to America directly from England. They had left England in 1608, locating briefly in Amsterdam before settling for more than a decade in Leiden. If a longing for religious freedom alone had compelled them, they might never have left that city. Years later, the pilgrim's governor, William Bradford, recalled that in Leiden, God had allowed them to come as near the primitive pattern as the first churches as any other church of these later times. As pilgrim Edwin Winslow, Winslow recalled, God had blessed them with much peace and liberty in Holland. They hoped to find the like liberty in their new home. But that's not all they hoped to find. Boiled down, the pilgrims had two major complaints about their experience in Holland. First, they found it a hard place to raise their children. Because the Dutch culture was too permissive, they believed, Bradford commented on the great licentiousness of youth in Holland and lamented the evil examples and manifold temptations of the place. Part of the problem was the Dutch parents. They gave their children too much freedom. 
Bradford's nephew, Nathaniel Morton, explained, and separatist parish parents could not give their own children due correction without reproof and reproach from their neighbors. Sounds like something that happened at Walmart not long ago as a mother was trying to correct her own child. They wanted to arrest her for punishing her own child. Compounding these challenges was what Brad Bradford called the hardness of the place. If Holland was a hard place to raise strong families, it was an even harder place to make a living. Leiden was a crowded, rapidly growing city. Most houses were ridiculously small by our standards, some with no more than a couple hundred square feet of floor space. The typical weaver's home was somewhat larger. It boasted three rooms, two on the main floor and one above, with a cistern under the main floor to collect rainwater, sometimes side by side with a pit for an indoor privy. In contrast to the seasonal rhythms of farm life, the pace of work was long, intense, and unrelenting. Probably half or more of the separatist families became textile workers. In this area, before the Industrial Revolution, cloth production was still a decentralized labor intensive process, with countless families carding, spinning, or weaving in their own homes from dawn until dusk, six days a week merely to keep the body and soul together. Hunger and want had become their taskmaster. This life of great labor and hard fare was a threat to the church. Bradford repeatedly stressed it discouraged separatists in England from joining them. He believed and tempted those in Leiden to return home. If religious freedom was to be thus linked with poverty, then there were some too many who would opt not for the religious, they would opt for the religious persecution of England over the religious freedom of Holland. And the challenge would only increase over time. Old age was creeping up on many of the congregation, indeed was being hastened prematurely by the great and continual labor. While the most resolute could endure such hardships in the prime of life, advanced age and declining strength would cause many either to sink under the burdens or reluctantly abandon the community in search of relief. In explaining the pilgrim decision to leave Holland, William Bradford stressed the pilgrim economic circumstances more than any other factor. But it is important that we hear correctly what he is saying. Bradford was not telling us that the pilgrims left for America in search of the American dream or primarily to maximize their own individual well-being. In Governor Bradford's telling, it is impossible to separate the pilgrims' concern about either the effects of Dutch culture or their economic circumstances from their concern for the survival of their church. The leaders of the Leiden congregation may not have feared religious persecution, but they saw spiritual danger and decline on the horizon. The solution the pilgrim leaders believed was to take away these discouragements by relocating to a place with greater economic opportunity as part of a cooperative mission to preserve their covenant community. In the congregation, if the congregation did not collectively dislodge to some place of better advantage, and soon the church seemed destined to erode like the banks of a stream as one by one families and individuals slipped away. Pernell Harrison. So where does this leave us? Were the pilgrims coming to America to flee religious persecution? Not at all. Were they motivated by a religious impulse? Absolutely. But why is it important to make these seemingly fair distinctions? 
is this just another exercise in academic hair splitting? I don't think so. In fact, I think that the implications of getting the Pilgrim's Motives rights are huge. As I reread the Pilgrim's words, I find myself meditating on Jesus' parable of the sower. You remember how the sower casts his good seed, which is the word of God, and it falls on multiple kinds of ground, not all of which prove fruitful. The seed that lands on stony ground sprouts immediately, but the plant withers under the heat of the noonday sun, while the seed cast among thorns springs up and then is choked by the surrounding weeds. The former, Jesus explained to his disciples, the former Jesus explained to his disciples, represents those who receive the word gladly but stumble when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake. The latter stands for those who allow the word to be choked by the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things. In emphasizing the pilgrim's search for religious freedom, we inadvertently make the primary menace in their story the heat of persecution. Persecution led them to leave England for Holland, but it was not the primary reason that they came to America. As the pilgrim writers saw it, the principal threat to their congregation in Holland was not the scorching sun, but strangling thorns. The difference matters particularly if we're approaching the pilgrim's moment in history as an opportunity to learn from them. It broadens the kind of conversation we have with them and makes it more relevant. When we hear of the pilgrim's resolve in the face of persecution, we may nod our heads admiringly and meditate on the courage of their convictions. Perhaps we will even ask ourselves how we would respond if, God forbid, we were to endure the same trial, and yet the danger seems so remote, the question so comfortably hypothetical. Whatever limitations we may chafe against in the public square, as Christians in the United States, we don't have to worry that the government will send us to prison unless we worship in a church that it chooses and interpret the Bible in a manner that it dictates dictates. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting that we never ask the question. Posing it can remind us to be grateful for the freedom we enjoy. It may inspire us to great vigilance in preserving that freedom and heighten our concerns for Christians around the world who cannot take such freedom for granted. These are good things, but I am suggesting that we do not dwell over long on a question. I'm dubious of the value of moral reflection that focuses on hypothetical circumstances, of avowals of how we would respond to imaginary adversity are worth pretty much what they cost us. Character isn't forged in the abstract, but in a concrete crucible of everyday life, in the myriad mundane decisions that both shape and reveal the heart's deepest loves.
Here, the pilgrims struggle with thorns to speak, speaks to us. Compared to the dangers they faced in England, their hardship in Holland were so ordinarily. I don't mean to minimize them, but merely to point out that they are difficulties we are more likely to relate to. They worried about their children's future. They feared the effects of a corrupt and permissive culture. They had a hard time making ends meet. They wondered how they would provide for themselves in old age. Does any of this sound familiar? Mm -hmm. And in contrast to their success in escaping persecution, they found the cares of the world much more difficult to evade. As it turned out, thorns, thorn bushes grew in the new world as well as the old. In little more than a decade, William Bradford was concerned that economic circumstances were again weakening the fabric of the church. This time, ironically, the culprit was not the pressure of want, but the prospect of wealth, which is the deceitfulness of riches. As faithful members of the congregation left Plymouth in search of larger, more productive farms. A decade after that, Bradford was decrying the presence of gross immorality within the colony. Drunkenness and sexual sin had become so common, he lamented that it caused him to fear and tremble at the consideration of our corrupt natures. When we insist the, that the pilgrims came to America in search of religious freedom, we tell their story in a way that they themselves wouldn't recognize. In the process, we make their story primarily a source of ammunition for the culture wars. Frustration, oh, frustrated by increasing governmental infringement on religious expression. We remind the unbelieving culture around us that our forefathers who founded this country were driven above all by a commitment to religious liberty. But while we're bludgeoning secularists with the pilgrim story, we ignore the aspects of their story that might cast a light into their own hearts. They struggled with fundamental questions still relevant to us today. What is the true cost of discipleship and what must we sacrifice in pursuit of the kingdom? How can we shine as lights in the world and keep ourselves unspotted from the world. What sort of obligation do we owe our local churches and how do we balance that duty with family commitments and individual desires? What does it look like to seek first the kingdom of God? And can we really trust God to provide for our other needs? We are familiar with the prophetic visions given to Daniel while he was living in Babylon and the times when he and his companions were challenged to live their lives according to the beliefs of the nation in which they lived. We are aware of the prophetic fulfillment in history that confirmed the leading nations of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. We also see the little horn power, 
the Roman papacy, and toward the end, the nation of the United States of America, which will set up an image to the beast. This image to the beast will require obedience to the papal Roman traditions, including mandatory worship attendance on the false day of worship, Sunday. It is notable that the societal conditions were existed in Holland, which drove the pilgrims, pilgrim Puritans, from their homes to embark on a dangerous ocean journey across the Atlantic exists today in our own country of the United States. Social justice warriors enforce rules of their own which are not the laws of the land. Freedom of religion has changed to become a, the mandra, mantra freedom from religion. Parents are not allowed to adequately discipline their own children to earn their adequate living. Both parents often must engage in full-time employment, sometimes at multiple jobs. And the crowding together into large cities with the accompanying availability of every simple pleasure distracts the children from the spiritual upbringing that the parents desired to impart. The pilgrims were not seeking a permanent home in America. They were seeking an opportunity to prepare themselves and their families for their final home in heaven and on the earth remade without a taint of sin. This is our goal also, which is why we are counseled to move out of the cities into the country. The lamb-like beast is about to speak like a dragon. The time is short and the work is difficult, but we must be about our father's business, spreading the good news to all within our community. May God bless you.